Please welcome to the stage Dr. Stuart H. Isaacson, Clinical Associate Professor of Neurology, Florida International University, to discuss learning about Parkinson's disease in off time. It's wonderful to be here and to see this uh, amazing turnout and amazing conference. I come from the east coast of Florida and Boca Raton and to see what Dean and, and his wife have, have done here is really amazing, so I'm, I'm happy to be here. And to talk to you a little bit this morning about uh, Parkinson's disease and, and off time. This is a presentation that we put together uh, with Synovi in a company that's looking to uh, have a new approval of a new medication, um, one that Bob Hauser will cover a little later today. And uh, this company, Synovian, has sponsored this, uh, this talk, and these are uh, slides that uh, we provided. During this talk, we're gonna make it a little bit interactive, hopefully, and get you some exercise. We don't have a personal testimonial today because all of you have your own personal testimonial. And as you all know, Parkinson's disease for each of you is what it is. It doesn't really matter what the person next to you is experiencing. It's the experiences that you have, the symptoms that you have, how you respond to medications, which medicines you respond to, and how you respond. And because it's so individualized, you really have to learn the language, the lingo that we use in the medical, the doctors and nurses side, so you can communicate effectively and try to have your treatment best managed and best adjusted. And in this vein, we're gonna talk a little bit about how the medications sometimes don't work continuously and are interrupted with the return of symptoms, these so-called off episodes or off periods. Throughout the uh, presentation, there are a number of questions you can see up here on the screen. And we're going to see if we can get a little audience response uh, with this. Um, and instead of raising your hand, I'd like to see if you could clap. So what's your, well, you can clap, good. So, so what's your current level of understanding of these uh, three types? Uh, who has a high degree of understanding of off time? Good, how about an average degree? And how about a low degree? Or are you... All righty, well, we're going to hope to change that uh, today. You've heard a lot today about Parkinson's disease. Dr. Sutherland covered a lot of the basics of Parkinson's disease. I don't want to be repetitive, and I don't have to remind all of you who filled this auditorium how common Parkinson's disease is. And while it's progressive, what that really means is we have to find ways to treat Parkinson's degree, de disease symptoms over 20 or 30 years. As you age, you age with Parkinson's disease, and that's why we're working so hard to get new treatments, new therapies, new research is going on, trying to identify better ways to replace dopamine, to find other pathways to try to treat Parkinson's disease, and to try to get better education so we can develop better therapies for people who have this. It's so common in this country, and it's probably a reason why there's so many companies here offering uh, information about how they're trying to play a role in having better treatments for this disease. And it's because of all these companies and all the people with Parkinson's that we have so much research going on. And I urge you to look on the internet, look in these pamphlets, and find research programs that you might be interested in being a part of, because that's really how we get better treatments. Each drug can only be approved if about 300 people to 600 people in the country participate in a trial. And often it takes three years to complete a trial like that. And if we could complete that trial in six months, we would have new treatments about two and a half years earlier. So really we're all in this together, as you might have heard elsewhere. When we think about the symptoms of Parkinson's, we often think about the movement or motor symptoms. And you've heard about this already today, but I'll point out a few things. One is that the main problem with Parkinson's, among all the problems, is this sense of slowness. Everything takes a bit longer. It's hard to quantify. It's sort of like a big uh, balloon. And when it's fully expanded, that's normal. But if it's a little bit less, you can't even see that it's smaller. But yet it could be 10 or 20% less. And we aim to try to improve that. 
and we ask you questions about how you are doing at different office visits. And it's sometimes it's very hard to answer how you're doing, because for the most part, you might be doing okay. But it's the other part we want to know about. And hopefully in this presentation, you can get some of the ideas of how you can communicate that other side, the time when the medicine's not really working well. Times when tremor might come back, or you might be slower to get out of a chair, more difficult to get in and out of a car or off of a soft couch. It may take longer to button, it may take longer to tie your shoes, put on earrings or makeup. Dressing and bathing may take much longer if the medicine's not working than it is when the medicine is working. It may be hard to time your activities, whether it's when you dress and bathe or prepare breakfast or get in the car to drive to physical therapy. The voice may become lower. It may look like you're not fully engaged because the facial muscles are slower. All these problems reflect the medications not working fully. It's part of Parkinson's, of course, but it's really part of us not having medicines that work well enough consistently enough. Sometimes you need a higher dose. Sometimes you need other medicines to help it work better. Sometimes you just need medicines that last longer. And we're working on all these types of medications, and we have a lot of these new medicines that are now available. It's not just motor symptoms, though, that are the problem in Parkinson's. And while I'm not going to touch much on this for the rest of my talk, you'll hear a lot about these medicines today, hopefully. Parkinson's affects much more than just movement. It's much more than replacing dopamine and seeing how long a dose lasts. Parkinson's affects other parts of the brain that are affecting memory and thinking. It zaps the motivation. It causes a sense of apathy in some people. Hallucinations and delusions can occur as part of a psychosis. People can have anxiety, even panic attacks. And these can all be treated we have medications that can treat mood and anxiety. We have medications that can treat hallucinations. We have medicines that can treat memory. So be aware that we have treatments for a lot of these other symptoms for Parkinson's as well. It can affect parts of the nervous system that control autonomic problems like blood pressure. Some people, when they stand up, the blood pressure falls in Parkinson's. And when that happens, you have to make sure you're hydrated and be aware of new medications that are available and medications that are being studied in research programs because this can be treated as part of Parkinson's. The bladder can be affected and there's bladder medicines. You've heard about sleep being so affected in the last lecture. Some people have sweats that can occur. Some people have trouble with bloating or constipation. And we have ways of dealing with these symptoms, so be aware of some things that can occur as part of Parkinson's that affects not only the movement, but affects throughout the brain and other parts of the nervous system. Some people get tingling or pain or aching, and this can occur when the medicines are not working fully. And what we try to understand is when these types of symptoms occur when the medicine effect begins to wear off, it might be something that can improve by keeping the medicines working more consistently. The gastrointestinal system is especially affected in Parkinson's. You've heard a little bit this morning from Dr. Sutherland that it might actually begin in the gut with this alpha-synuclein that can affect the motility not only of the body but also of how the intestinal tract and stomach and esophagus works. It's important to recognize that the medicines we often take go through this GI system. And because it's so common for people to have symptoms that reflect the stomach or the intestines or the colon with constipation, it's important to be aware of this because it can affect how your medications work. Time for a little bit of a hand clapping, a foot stomping. So for people who have only motor symptoms and no non-motor symptoms, who are you? Clap. How about those who have mainly non-motor symptoms as your biggest problem? And it sounds like most of you have both motor and non-motor symptoms. Well, hopefully that clapping was for all the new medicines that have become available over the past five years to treat both motor and non-motor symptoms. And remarkably, we now have uh, medications for things on this list. Whoops. Uh, 
on that last list to treat things like low blood pressure, psychosis, memory, and, um, and dyskinesia. So let's turn a little bit now to why we have these off periods. You heard earlier today about this important chemical, dopamine, that exists in the brain. Dopamine helps brain cells communicate. It's when you think about moving and then you can move this pathways that occur, and the way that one cell talks to another is by releasing this chemical called dopamine. And dopamine is an essential neurotransmitter, along with things like adrenaline and noradrenaline and serotonin and acetylcholine. All these chemicals help the brain communicate and function and help you think and move and talk and walk and such. But in Parkinson's, the part of the brain that makes most of the dopamine, not all the dopamine, but most of the dopamine, degenerates, and those brain cells can no longer make enough dopamine. And because they don't make enough dopamine, you develop tremor and slowness and stiffness and, and all these symptoms of motor and some non-motor symptoms. And we try to replace dopamine because normally in food that you eat, there's small amino acids that make up proteins, and one of them, L-tyrosine, is converted to levodopa and then into dopamine in these brain cells and released. But if you don't have enough brain cells, you can't make enough dopamine. So we aim to give extra levodopa. Those are those pills you take with the carbidopa and levodopa. The levodopa gets into the body, it gets into the brain, it gets converted to dopamine in a natural way, and it's released to facilitate movement. But in Parkinson's, only about half the dopamine you need is made. You have to make up the extra half with these different types of medications. And we have a lot of different types of medications. We have medications that contain levodopa, the good old-fashioned Cinemet and the generic Cinemet. We have the newer extended release formulations. Initially, we had a drug called CR Cinemet, and then we had this drug called Stilevo, and now we have a drug called Ritari. We're working on new drugs that can last six or eight hours in the bloodstream, and we're trying to get longer and longer. We even have infusions that can last for 24 hours delivering levodopa, and you'll hear about some of these things uh, uh, from Dr. Hauser's talk. Sometimes, though, we give medicines that don't become dopamine, but mimic dopamine and bind to the same place that dopamine be binds to, these so-called dopamine proteins, receptor proteins. And these last longer and work almost as well as dopamine, but not quite as well. And these can come in pills, and these can come in patches, and we're working on an experimental one that's an infusion in a small pump, and it can come in an injection pen, and it can come hopefully next year in a research medicine that goes under the tongue, but a lot of different ways to try to get dopamine agonists into the body to help. And then we have a group of medicines that don't become dopamine and don't mimic dopamine, but they prevent the dopamine from being broken down too quickly either in the bloodstream, so it stays there longer, it can get into the brain for a longer duration of time, or in the brain itself, where dopamine, when it's released, isn't broken down and stays in the brain for a longer period of time. And you'll hear a lot about these medications in Dr. Hauser's talk as well. In the industry, I'm known as a warm-up act for Dr. Hauser. One problem we have besides the medication not lasting long enough because it's a short-acting medicine though, is that we ask you to swallow levodopa. We want the levodopa to go to the brain to become dopamine, but we tell you to put it in your mouth and swallow it and it heads the wrong way. It also heads the wrong way into the part of the body, the GI, the stomach, the intestines, where we think Parkinson's begins. The esophagus is very slow in Parkinson's. The stomach is slow. Sometimes when you eat, you can feel bloated or get full quickly. It's a sign of what we call gastroparesis or slowness of the emptying of the stomach. Not only food gets slowed, causing the bloating, but also medications. And levodopa may get caught up in the stomach and take too long to work. When it finally gets out of the stomach into the intestine, it has to be absorbed. It's absorbed like other proteins, small amino acids are absorbed. And if there's protein there, it can impede its absorption. It's like going through the doorways here to get out at the break. Everyone's trying to go through it once, it slows it down. Same thing when you take levodopa when you eat protein. It may be slower and less may be able to get in. 
it's not a problem for most people. Most people can eat whatever they want to eat with medicine. You can take Cinemet with food or without food, with protein or without protein. But some people can't. Some people, when they have a tuna fish sandwich or a big piece of fish or meat, the pills don't work well enough or, or don't work at all. And if that's you, then you should let your doctor or nurse know. Also, more recently, we've become aware of bacteria that line the gut normally can interfere also with the absorption of levodopa or shunt it away from being absorbed. So there's a lot of things that are problematic with swallowing levodopa. And it's why we've worked trying to find new medications that are not swallowed. And it's why if you're walking around here at the exhibits or you're reading about things online, you're aware of levodopas that we can inhale, new medicines that we put under the tongue, things that we can inject, pumps that go into the stomach, pumps that go into the skin like diabetic insulin pumps to give medicines. All these different non-oral ways of trying to get medicine in because trying to just rely on the GI tract is problematic in Parkinson's because it's so affected by the disease itself. So let's change gears now and, and turn to this, this idea of off time and, and what off is because for better or for worse, in the early 1970s, shortly after levodopa was introduced and was able to be given to people widespread and Cinemet first, first was able to be commercially marketed, there were conferences where Parkinson's experts gathered and began to talk about their patients who had so much improvement when levodopa was first begun. But then after a few months or a year or two or three, the symptoms came back. And then they took another dose and the symptoms went away. And then after a few hours, the symptoms came back. And it went on and on, back and forth. And they had to have a name for this. And doctors not being the most creative bunch, name these times that when the medicine is working, they call that on. The medical effect was on, it was working. And when the symptoms came back, the medicine effect was off. And they called that an off period, an off episode. And we're stuck with these terms. On is good, off is bad. Off means the medicine's not working fully and your symptoms of Parkinson's have returned or reemerged. When the benefit of a dose of medicine is no longer there, we call that an off episode. And when you take a dose of medicine and after a time it begins to work, we say that you're on again. You could be a little on, you could be fully on, you could be on with dyskinesia, you could be on with troublesome dyskinesia. But when the medicine effect wanes, we call that an off episode. You need to know these words. You need to know how it relates to your symptoms, your motor symptoms, your non-motor symptoms, a combination. Some people, when the medicine effect begins to wane, have non-motor symptoms of anxiety or achiness or cloudy thinking, and then the tremor comes out or the slowness comes out, and it gets more and more until you take your next dose and it begins to work. And it turns out that everyone has their own type of off episodes, but there's some generalized types that we can talk about to make, make you think a bit about it. These types of diagrams we think about when we design research trials, when we think about changing your medicine, and we think about what medicine to stop or to increase or to add to your regimen. In this little cartoon, you can see the blue zone. That's the good zone. That's the normal zone. That's when movement is normal. It's, it's close to normal. You can walk and talk and look like you don't even have much Parkinson's at all. We well, wanna be in that blue zone all the time. It's very easy to accomplish in the first couple of years of taking Cinemet. Some people have called this for that reason a honeymoon period. Depends on your honeymoon, I guess. But the, the honeymoon period is when the medicines are working. You can miss a pill, you can take a pill late, and nothing seems to happen. But invariably, within one year, or three years, or five years, or by seven years, but somewhere in that range, everyone begins to notice that a single dose of medication no longer works all day. After three or four or five hours, symptoms come back. And that's not a problem with your Parkinson's. 
It doesn't mean you have bad Parkinson's. It doesn't mean your Parkinson's hasn't gone to another stage. It doesn't mean anything except our medicines are lousy. Our medicines aren't good enough. They don't last long enough. So we have to start to take them closer and closer together, add medicines that mimic dopamine, add medicines that prevent the breakdown of dopamine to make each dose last a little bit longer. That's why we have so many medicines we often prescribe. We're trying to fill in the gaps between doses because our gold standard levodopa is too short acting in the bloodstream. It stays in the bloodstream only for about an hour and a half and in the brain for an hour or two longer. It's why we're looking for longer acting medications, trying to find infusions, trying to find things to break the gap. As the disease goes on into more years and 10 and 15 or more years, the time that levodopa works, that on time may be even shorter. It might get as short as two and a half hours, sometimes less. You may take medicine every three hours and sometimes it lasts three hours and another dose lasts two and a half hours and another dose lasts two hours and 45 minutes. And you may take your next dose and it might work rather rapidly in 15 or 20 minutes. Or another dose might take an hour to work. Another dose may take 40 minutes. And this combination of never really knowing when the dose is gonna to begin to work, how long it'll take, how long it will be on and work well, and when the symptoms will begin to reemerge in an off period, can really disrupt the day. These off periods can become very unexpected of when they occur. And it's why we try to do several things in our treatment strategies. We try to find medicines that work more rapidly and more reliably by avoiding the swallowing the oral route. We try to find levodopers that last longer with extended releases and infusions. And we try to find things that you can take when you need it. A new class of medications that have been called on demand, allowing you to carry them around. And if you begin to feel an off episode and you don't think swallowing another dose of medicine is going to work quickly enough or it's not time for it, you now have options where you can inhale levodopa, where you can inject a medication. And soon, hopefully, you can put a strip under the tongue to, for the medication. We have all these different things that will be coming. So as these new things come, you may wonder, why do we need all these different medicines? And one way to think about it is that there's a lot of different types of off episodes that can occur. We can think about them temporally throughout the day when they might occur. First thing in the morning, around mealtime, late in the afternoon, at night or overnight. We can think about them, how they occur. Is it that the medicine works quick but just doesn't last long enough? Or the medicine takes too long to work or you never really know when it's gonna work. Some doses quick and some doses longer. But they seem to last long enough but the next dose takes too long to work again. Most people have a combination of both. A dose doesn't last long enough, the symptoms come back during an off episode and you take your next dose and it may work quickly or not, you just don't know. So many people need to have levodopa adjusted with the regular or the extended release levodopa, using some of the adjunctive baseline therapies that prevent its breakdown or mimic its effect, and also have something they can take just in case the symptoms come out that they can inject or breathe in or put under their tongue. So most people need a combination of these. So let's talk a little bit about morning off, symptoms in the morning. Some people wake up in the morning and they feel the best they feel all day. Some people wake up in the morning and they can't move. They can't turn over in bed, they can't get out of bed, they're slow and they're stiff. It could be a real problem because if you take your medicine, even if you take it right away in bed and you get up to start your day and you go into the bathroom to bathe and groom, you go into the kitchen to try to get breakfast and your mobility is lousy because you're still in a morning off, that's a high risk where you could trip or fall or something could happen. So we want medicines to work rather rapidly in the morning. It's a time of day that is very common for medicines not to be working still because they've worn off from the day before and the morning off can be a big problem. It often affects the quality of life, the ability to do daily activities, and it may set in place for the day where the medicine never really works well until the second dose. 
So if you recognize that you have symptoms in the morning and the first dose of medicine is not working quickly enough or well enough, let your doctors and nurses know because they may be able to either adjust the medicine in the morning or add something to help you not wake up so off or give you something that can let you on demand turn back on more quickly. So it's time to uh, clap your hands. If you experience off time in the morning like this, uh, that's a yes. So who, who has off time in the morning? I'd also like to point out to Dr. Hauser back there that I'm getting more applause than he is getting. <laughs> if you never have off time in the morning and you wake up and it's the best time of your day, clap your hands. One of the most common types of off episodes that people experience is that a dose of medicine doesn't last long enough. It doesn't have to be every dose. When you see your doctors and nurses and they say, how long is your medicine lasting? Does it ever wear off? If three out of four times it works long enough and one out of four times it doesn't, and you don't know which of the four doses is gonna last, the answer is no, my medicine's not working well enough. You have to point out the problems that are occurring. When the medicine begins to wear off, some people feel a little funny, a little tingly in a limb, achy, you might feel anxious, you might think your thinking is not as clear, you might feel fatigued, you might feel down, and then after 10 or 15 minutes, you might notice you're a little slower, you have trouble getting out of a chair, the voice might be lower, a tremor could come out. This is what we mean by loss of benefit of a dose of medicine, this, this off episode. You need to be aware of when these occur, how they occur. Not every day, don't keep an everyday diary, but for a day or two before your next visit. Be aware of when these off episodes begin and how long after a dose of medicine and what happens and how much worse do they get until you take your next dose. Once you take your next dose, that's really the end of wearing off and the beginning of, of on. Now who has these symptoms when after taking a dose of medicine after two or three or four hours, the medicine effect benefit is lost and symptoms come back? How many people don't experience this type of problem? Once you take your next dose of medication, it has to work. Even if you swallow a pill, you're still off until it begins to work. And because of the problem with the movement of the esophagus and stomach and intestinal tract and the role of protein and such, sometimes it works in 20 minutes, sometimes in 40 minutes. Some people know exactly how long it takes to work. Some people, every dose is different. Some doses quick and some doses it takes longer. So it's really important to be aware not only how long a dose of medicine lasts and what symptoms occur when it begins to wane and the benefit of a medicine is lost, but how long it takes for the next dose to work. Because the combination of this wearing off with the onset, how long it takes for a dose to work, defines how long an off episode is. That's the wrong question, so we're going to go. So how many people notice that sometimes when they take a dose of medicine, either first thing in the morning, around mealtime, some other time, it may take longer to work than usual? So it's a big problem. How many people feel each dose works quickly, every dose? Well, it's, it's interesting because we've been working on some projects lately, and we've seen for example, when we took 15 people and had them each swallow a dose of Cinemet and measured in their bloodstream levodopa in the bloodstream, everyone was different. A few had it work in 20 minutes, a few had it in the bloodstream in an hour, some it took uh, 30 minutes and it went only this high, some it took 30 minutes and went this high, and it showed a great variability that when you swallow Cinemet, expect variability and how long it takes to work, how well each dose works. Some doses work better, some doses don't work as well or may not work at all, what we call a dose failure. Sometimes it works quick, sometimes it takes a long time, sometimes it lasts a long time, and sometimes it lasts a short time. This variability is why we're looking for longer acting medicines and new ways of treating this, looking at other chemicals besides dopamine, looking at longer duration dopamines and such. 
Sometimes the off time can be unexpected. And a certain day, you're usually on. And today you're off, and you don't know why. You try calling the doctor's office, you get through the phone maze, get someone to answer you maybe, and, and maybe they say, well, maybe you're getting a urine infection, or maybe you didn't sleep well, or maybe you ate something, or maybe you're coming down with something, or whatever. So these unexpected off episodes can be particularly problematic because you don't expect them and you're in the middle of doing something and you don't expect to be off. How common are they though? Who has unexpected off episodes? When the off episodes are unexpected, clap if they disrupt your day. That last question was for Bob Hauser. He's doing a lot of work in how these off episodes can disrupt the day. But it's a big problem, and I think you'll hear in his talk a lot of the new medications that we have. Uh, another problem that we have, though, is that it may take too long to work. It may not last long enough, but sometimes a dose may not work at all. You swallow the pill and it just doesn't work. We call this a dose failure. Who experiences these? Because of this problem of having uh, all these different types of off, um, there was a lot of work done to try to see, not just with the clapping, but, but actually do a study and see how common they are. And the Michael Fox Foundation about five years ago now did an internet survey where they surveyed about 3,000 people. We think it was 3,000 people. It could have been one person who voted 3,000 times, uh, if it was carried out in Florida anyway. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm from Florida. Um, but what, he, what that survey found is that over 90% of people experience what you experience, an off episode at least one time a day. And about half of those people who responded to the survey had an off episode at least three times a day. Some had four or more episodes throughout the day. And you can imagine how disruptive uh, that, that this is. And two-thirds of people who had off episodes felt that it happened more than two hours a day. That is, of the 14 or 16 hours of being awake, more than two of those hours, the medicine was not working. The benefit of medicine was lost. They were in an off time. And indeed, when we do our research trials, people often have an average of six hours. So only about half the day sometimes is a good on effect for medicine. And the other half is made up of off time or dyskinesia. And this whole day we would like to be good on time, where the medicine's working well, without off time and without having dyskinesia. And that's why we're doing so much work in trying to get new medicines and trying to study and find new medicines. So how many people have no off uh, episodes a day? How many people have one or two episodes a day? That three or four? Anyone have five or more? And now think about if you add up all the time when your medicine's not working. When the symptoms begin to come back and the benefit of a dose is lost until you take your next medicine and actually begins to work to improve symptoms. Think about how much time in the day you're off. So if you have no off, this is asking for the morning, but forget the morning, let's do all day. If you have all, all during the day, how many people have an hour or less? How many people have one or two hours when the medicine's not working? And, and how many people have more than two hours a day when they feel their medicine's not working? Well, we have a lot of medicines that you, I've hinted at and you'll hear about uh, later today from Dr. Hauser, um, but there's much more than medicines to think about when you treat your Parkinson's disease. And whether it's boxing or yoga or dance, whether you're walking or swimming or walking in a pool, whether you're doing calisthenics or going to the gym, you have to do something. Exercise is part of Parkinson's because Parkinson's zaps the mobility, so you have to exercise. 
you may not be motivated or want to exercise, but you have to do it anyway. It has nothing to do with, it's like taking your medicines, you have to exercise. Now you don't have to exercise every day, but you should exercise five days a week. Weekends you can come to conferences like this or sleep on Sunday. But you should exercise five days a week. You can exercise 15 or 20 minutes every day. You can read about research that suggests that doing high intensity exercise for an hour every day can help uh, Parkinson's symptoms and potentially slow progression. But even if you don't do that high intensity, do something every day. You need to do something where your mind is thinking about moving. So it's not just saying I walk back and forth to my car as I go into McDonald's for coffee. That doesn't work. But if you drive to McDonald's and walk around McDonald's twice, that's exercise if you're thinking about it. But exercise is important for mobility, for mood, uh, for general health. Other wellness strategies are very important as well. Maintaining good, healthy uh, lifestyle, eating well, anxiety, uh, coping strategies, support groups, social workers, nurses, being involved in educational activities, awareness, doing crafts is particularly useful, making things, putting things together, doing puzzles, looking for word search puzzles, looking for fine Waldo puzzles, trying to fill in the words for Mad Libs, all these types of things are helpful. And you just need to stay involved. And then you should try to do everything you like to do in life. Parkinson's should not become your new way of life. It should be something you live with and do what you like to do. Golfing is particularly good. Tennis, any type of activities that you like to do, continue doing. Now, let's turn gears finally in this last slide or two. You will experience when you go to see your doctors and nurses that there's a pressure. There's a pressure of how long you have to wait. There's a pressure of how long you're gonna get into the room and, and talk to someone before the doctor or nurse comes in and how long you're gonna have with them. How do you get it all out? How do you let the people who are taking care of you and trying to help you manage Parkinson's and adjust your medications and choose new medicines, decide whether to continue or stop current medications. How do you tell them everything you experience since you saw them last three or four or five or six months ago? How do you tell them about the off episodes, when they occur, how many occur, how many hours they affect, how long each dose takes to work, how long each dose lasts, whether they occur in the morning, mealtime, afternoon time, nighttime. It's a lot of information to convey. It's hard to remember and just casually talk about it. You can casually talk about it and get a casual answers to try to adjust your medicine, and that's almost fine. But it's not good enough if you're experiencing problems that you want to have address. I think there's two major things that you can do if you want to relate the information more clearly and try to give a more accurate depiction of what you're experiencing since you last saw your doctor or your nurse or your PA or your nurse practitioner. Or One thing you can do is you can write down your biggest problem. You can write down your two or three other big problems. You can write down your best time of day and you can write down your worst time of day. That in itself would be very helpful. You can write down how long your medicines usually last, how long they usually take to work, and you can also write down how often they don't work quickly enough or they don't last long enough or they unexpectedly don't work. Or for a day or two before your visit, you can map out your day. You can say how you feel when you wake up and at what time you get up usually how long before you take your first dose and how long before that first dose begins to improve your symptoms and you turn on, how long that first dose lasts to keep you on, what symptoms occur when the benefit is lost, when you take your next dose and how long that dose takes to work, and so on for the three or four or five doses you take a day. If you did that just one day before your next visit and brought in that map, that could be very helpful to the person adjusting your medication. Think about your motor symptoms that bother you, but also think about your non-motor symptoms. 
the ones that affect your thinking, your mood, whether you see things that aren't there, whether you get anxious, whether you have apathy, whether you have low blood pressure, you get dizzy or lightheaded when you stand up, whether you have too much movements when you take too much medicine, the dyskinesias that can occur, whether you have bladder problems or constipation, whether you get bloated after a meal or you get nauseous, <coughs> all these can be helpful to try to choose the right medication strategy for you. And think about some of the questions on the slide here. Do you ever take a dose of medicine and it takes longer than usual to work? First thing in the morning around mealtime or other times. Do you ever take a dose of medicine and it no longer lasts four hours, it lasts shorter? And what symptoms occur? Whether you have times of the day that you're like almost normal and other times when you're not so normal at all. And ask, how do I get my medicines to keep me the best I can be as consistently as possible throughout the day without having side effects from too much, whether it's dyskinesia or nausea or confusion, but without having times when the medicine's not working and you're having an off episode. All these can help you take control and empower you to help get the best treatment and to become aware of medications. Some of medicines that are in the room have been available for 15 years and yet you may never have heard about them or only hear about them when you come to a meeting like this. And other ones are brand new and only available for six months and you're seeing for the first time at a meeting like this. Try to ask these questions to find out about all these different types of new medicines that are available. We'll skip that question. So finally, uh, this last slide just uh, reminds us that it's true Parkinson's disease is very common, but the bonus of that is there's so much money going into research and so many people in research trying to find ways to slow down the disease, to find ways to reverse it or to cure it. And I think you'll hear a few of these things from Dr. Hauser later. Also, we're looking for better treatments treatments that avoid the swallowing into the gut that can be taken by other means, whether it's under the tongue or inhaled or injection, that can work more rapidly and reliably than swallowing a pill that you can carry around and take when you have symptoms that come back. And new medicines that work in other chemicals, like glutamate and adenosine that can help the cinemets last longer. And new medicines that can prevent its breakdown in the brain to make it last longer or outside the brain We've had two new medicines for Parkinson's approved every year for the past five years and two more coming this year in 2020. So we have a lot of new things to keep up with. That's why these types of meetings are so important. I just don't know where they're going to get a bigger room for next year. But it's important to recognize that the problem when your symptoms come back is not a problem necessarily that your disease is getting worse but that our medicines are not optimal. They're too short acting, and we have to use these strategies to make them work more continuously. But be assured that a combination of the right dose of levodopa, the right extended preparation or short preparation or combination, medicines that make it last longer or mimic it, medicines you can take on demand to improve symptoms right away, medicines that treat non-motor symptoms like psychosis and low blood pressure, medicines for dyskinesia that are available now, augmenting surgical and advanced therapies with pumps and, and such can all help you be as close to normal in your movement and non-motor symptoms much, much better than we could have done five or 10 years ago. So a lot of work has been done. I think you can benefit from these if you record your symptoms, relate them adequately with your doctors and nurses, and then have people who can choose and try things. Trying something is easy. If it doesn't work, you can always stop it after a month or two. So I hope this was uh, helpful to uh, Dr. Hauser for his presentation and to uh, all of you for uh, uh, thinking about off time. And I thank you for listening and I hope you have a good rest of the day.